In section 4.6, we look at exponential, logistic, and logarithmic models. First, let's talk about some properties of exponential functions. If we have a function of the form f of x equals c times a to the x power, and c is a positive number, and a is, of course, a positive base bigger than 1, this is a model for what we call exponential growth. And you can see the graph down here. The domain of this function is all real numbers, and the range of this function is all positive numbers, and you can see that it is a rapidly increasing function. The second graph models an exponential function where you still have a positive constant here, but the number a, the base, is now a positive number that is less than 1. And the graph of this model looks like this, and you can see that this is a decreasing function, and this models exponential decay. Let's take a look at an example. Let's look at a model for radioactive decay. Suppose it takes 29 years for an initial amount, A sub 0, of strontium 90 to break down into half the initial amount, a sub 0 divided by 2. That is, the half-life of this element is 29 years. So the half-life means that this is the time required for half of the substance to decay. So if we're given an initial amount, A 0 grams, of strontium 90 at time equals 0, find an exponential decay model, A of t, equals a sub 0 times e to the kt that gives the amount of strontium 90 at a time t where t is greater than or equal to 0. So first of all, let's write down the formula for this model. So we know that the amount of this element at any time t is equal to the initial amount that we start with times e to the kt power. Now, they don't tell us how much that we start with. So a sub 0 is going to be itself. And this is the initial quantity. And we also don't know what k is. Now, k deals with how fast the substance decays. So we need to figure out what is this number k. What we do know is that when time equals 29 years, the amount that we will have left over is the initial amount divided by 2, right? Because they tell us that the half-life is 29 years. So at that specific value for t, we will have half of what we started with. And half of what we started with is the initial quantity, a sub 0, divided by 2. So what I can do is I can plug these quantities into the formula. So the amount that we will have will be a sub 0 divided by 2. This will be equal to the amount we start with, a sub 0, raised to the power e to the k multiplied by the amount of time that it takes for us to have half left over. And that, of course, is 29 years. So this becomes a sub 0 divided by 2 is equal to a sub 0 times e to the k times 29 is 29k. Now what I can do on both sides here is I can multiply by 1 over a naught or 1 over a 0. And what this will do is it will cancel the a sub 0 on both sides. And that leaves us with 1 half is equal to e to the 29k. Now to solve for k, I just need to solve for k by, I'm sorry, to solve for k, I need to take the natural log of both sides. So I take the natural log of the left side, and this is equal to the natural log of the right side. And the reason we do this is because we know the natural log of e to the 29k is just going to give us 29k because natural log of e to a power cancels out. So we get natural log of 1 half is equal to 29k. 
And the last thing we can do here is divide both sides by 29, and k is equal to the natural log of 1 half divided by 29. And then we can plug this into a calculator to get a decimal approximation for k. So plugging this into a calculator, we get a value of approximately negative 0 0.0239. And just so you know, this is the same as negative 2.39%. And this is what you might call the decay rate, or you could say the rate of decay. And so what that means is every year that goes by, it loses 2.39% of what it used to have. So that's why the rate is negative, because it's decaying. It's losing not gaining. Now what I can do is I can take that value of k, this value here, and I can plug it back into our function up here. And if we do that, we get a of t is equal to a sub 0 times e to the negative 0 0.0239 times t. And this is the model for exponential decay. So now we can answer the second part of this question where it says calculate the time required for this substance to decay to one-tenth of what it started with. So the question for part B is when will the amount be equal to one-tenth of the amount that we started with? So for this, we are just going to substitute one-tenth times a zero into the formula. And if we do that, we get one-tenth a sub zero is equal to a sub zero times e to the negative 0 0.0239t. If we then multiply both sides by one over a zero, on the left-hand side, the a zeros cancel out. On the right-hand side, the a zeros cancel out. And we end up getting one-tenth is equal to e to the negative 0 0.0239t. Now to solve for t, I will just take the natural log of both sides. So we get the natural log of one-tenth is equal to the natural log of e to the negative 0 0.0239t. Once again, the natural log and E cancel out here. And we end up with the natural log of 1 tenth is equal to negative 0 0.0239t. And the last thing we need to do here is just divide both sides by negative 0 0.0239. And these cancel out, and we end up getting T equals approximately 96.3 years. So that means it will take about 96 years for there to be one-tenth the amount of what you started with. So for example, if you started with 500 grams of the substance, after 96 years, there would be 50 grams left over. Okay, and this is an example of radioactive decay. Next, let's take a look at modeling population growth. The population of the United States is expected to grow from 282 million in the year 2000 to 335 million in the year 2020. Find a function of the form P of T, P stands for population, equals C times E to the KT, and this should model the population growth T is the number of years after the year 2000, and P of T is in millions of people. So what we know here is P of T is equal to C times E to the KT. We also know that in the year 2000, time is equal to zero, because that's the beginning for this problem. 
And at that same time, the population, P of zero, is going to be 282, which of course stands for 282 million. So we know that this P value is 282 when our T value is zero. So this says that 282 is equal to C times E to the K times zero, which is zero. And we need to remember that anything to the zero power is one. So this is 282 is equal to C, right? Because E to the zero equals one. And now that we know what C is, we can say that the population model, P of T, if I just take this value of C and plug it back into the original equation here, we get 282 times E to the KT. Now, to completely model this population growth, we also need to know what K is. Now, to figure out what K is, we have to use some other information, right? So they also told us that there will be 335 million people in 2020. So in 2020, which corresponds to T equals 20, the population at that particular time, so the population at 20, is equal to 335 million people. So that means what I can do now is plug in 335 for our population, and we know that this happens when T equals 20, and that will tell us that 335 is equal to 282 times E to the K times 20 power, and this means 335 is equal to 282e to the 20k. And now to solve for k, what I'm going to do is divide both sides by 282. And that gives us 335 over 282 is equal to e to the 20k. Now from here, I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. So we get the natural log of 335 over 282 is equal to the natural log of E to the 20K. And we know that the natural log and the E here cancel out. And this, of course, gives us the natural log of 335 over 282 is equal to 20K. And then to solve for 20, to, for, to solve for K, rather, I'm going to divide by 20 on both sides. And that gives us a K value of the natural log of 335 over 282, all divided by 20. And we'll plug this into a calculator to get an approximation. And if we round this to, let's say, four decimal places, we get approximately 0 0.0086. And this, of course, means 0.86%. But when we go to plug it back into our model, we use the non-percentage version of this number. So plugging this back in, we have our final model here, which is P of T equals 282 times E to the KT, and K is 0 0.0086 times T. And now we can use that equation to estimate the population at any particular time. So in part B, it says to estimate the population of the United States in the year 2016. So to do this, first of all, we have to know that in the year 2016, T is equal to 16. And the population at that time will be the population at T equals 16. And we're just going to plug in 16 for T. So we get 282E to the point 0, 0.0086 multiplied by 16, and we can plug this in for an approximation. And when we do this, we get approximately 323.6, and remember this is million, right? So that's how many people we would expect to have in the year 2016. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because in the year 2000, we start with 282 million people. And then we know that in 2020, we will have 335 million people. 
So in 2016, we're not quite to 335 million people. And you can see that this number that we got here does seem to make sense in that regard. So again, this is an extremely useful model. We're modeling exponential growth here. Yes, populations of people grow exponentially. The last model we're going to talk about is the logistic model. The logistic model is another way of looking at something like population growth. So just note that it is unrealistic that any population would simply tend to infinity over a long period of time. So if you think about it, exponential growth always gives you a graph that looks something like this. Well, if you're talking about, say, the number of people on the planet, this can't continue forever, right? We, we can't get more and more and more people because we don't have enough resources for all those people. So this brings up a different model for population growth called the logistic function. And its basic format is the function that you see here. And don't worry, I would not make you memorize this formula. Okay. But these numbers A, B, and C are constants that are determined by a particular set of data. And if you find these constants, then you can estimate the population a little more realistically. So what's happening is basically this. If you look at the graph down below, you have a population that is beginning to grow. And it grows very, very rapidly at first. And it continues to grow rapidly until you get to resource constraints. And then it will level off, right? So whether you're talking about people or whether you're talking about, you know, antelopes on the savanna or something like that, eventually the population will level off because it can't keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Because there just simply isn't enough food, for example. All right, so let's take a look at an example of this logistic model. So in this example, it says the spread of the flu in an elementary school can be modeled by a logistic function. The number of children infected with the flu virus T days after the first infection is given by this formula. N of T equals 150 divided by 1 plus 4E to the negative 0.5T. Okay. So the first question here, it says, how many children were initially infected with the flu? So initially means at the beginning. And at the beginning, time is equal to zero. So for this, we are going to let T be equal to zero. So the number of people infected when T equals zero, we are going to plug zero into this function. And we do that by replacing the T here with zero. So we get 150 divided by one plus four times E to the negative 0.5 times zero. Do the math slowly here. This is 150 divided by one plus four E and negative 0.5 times zero is zero. And we know that e to the 0 is 1, right? Because anything to the 0 power is 1. And this is simply 150 divided by 1 plus 4. 1 plus 4 is 5. And 150 divided by 5 is 30. So in the beginning, there were 30 children at this school infected with the flu. Now they ask us, how many children were infected with the flu virus after five days? And then how many were infected after 10 days? So to do this, all we have to do is plug in the numbers five and 10 into our function. Now the difference is to do this, we will need to use a calculator, right? So the number of children infected after five days is equal to 150 divided by one plus four times E to the negative 0.5 multiplied by 5. And this is 150 divided by 1 plus 4 times e. Now I could do this part. Negative 0.5 times 5 is negative 2.5. But that's all I'm going to do in my head. The rest of this I'm going to plug into a calculator and we'll get an approximation for this. 
And you can see the calculation down below here. Notice that I use parentheses when I divide the 150 by this denominator here. That's very important. But if we approximate this to the nearest whole number, because we're talking about people, this would be approximately 113 people, right? So after five days, the number of infections went from 30 people to 113 people. That's a pretty drastic increase. Now, if you want to know the number of people infected after 10 days, all we have to do is plug in T equals 10. And when we plug in T equals 10, it looks like this. Then I can do this first part without a calculator. Let's see, we have 1 plus 4 e to the power negative 0.5 times 10 is negative 5. And we can also plug this into a calculator. And you'll notice that when we do that, we get approximately 146 people. So after 10 days, there are 146 people infected. Now, there are more people, but I want you to notice that it does seem to be leveling off, right? So we started with 30 children with the flu. After five days, that increased by 83 people. There's now 113 people infected. But after another five days, it didn't increase by nearly as much. It increased by 33 people. And that's because it is leveling off. And the reason it's leveling off is, is a couple of reasons. So uh, number one, you could have some of the children who are getting better, recovering. But also, number two, there's just not that many kids in the school, right? Like it can't just keep growing and growing and growing forever. So it begins to level off because the maximum number that you could ever reach in a particular school would be the total number of people in that school. So this is just a, a much more realistic model for uh, exponential growth in the real world, because in the real world, things usually cannot grow forever.